So what we do here is just as important as what we don't do here. So let's stop, drop, and weed. cleaning out the guinea pens and creating a new compost pile that the chickens will help us with. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Renewed Homestead. It's first day of fall and it's coming in like a lion of all things. Rain and wind and I think our trees might be naked before we get the color out of them this season, but we'll have to see. But uh, you, we might do a little editing because we might get chased in by another rainstorm here. But yes. Anyway, uh, so today we want to talk about chemicals and I know that doesn't sound very exciting, but uh, we need to have the discussion because as I said, what we're doing here is just as important as what we're not doing and you don't see us really using any chemicals. You see us making compost so we don't have to buy commercial fertilizers, but you know, we're also not out spraying, you know, chemicals for weeds and, and things like that. So. Let's go back and classify the different types of, of chemicals that we're talking about anyway. You've got um, insecticides, kill insects. You've got herbicides to kill pretty much anything gr growing that's green. And you've got fungicides to kill funguses. And we apply over a billion pounds of chemicals every single year. And that's just in the United States? Just in the United States. A billion pounds. Yeah, that that's is a between lot. Between commercial, agricultural, and homeowners. Right. So let's uh, step back a little bit. And where we really started ramping up the use of chemicals was really in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And that's where, well, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, well, what we started to see, so 60s, 70s, um, they were starting to use more pesticides and we had we had actually as we'll talk about in this video we had started using them you know early 1900s um, for agricultural purposes uh, but in the 70s they turned around and said that it's okay to spray the chemicals on crops it will stay on the crops it's not going to leach um, into the uh, groundwater that, uh, you know, Ben, had, uh, we were talking about this earlier and he's like, it's like a Berkey water filter, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to filter out all the bad. The soil's going to act as a protectant and <laughs> we're going to be good. It'll all be good. Yeah. yeah well, the, as we know, didn't happen that way. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it does uh, sink into the ground. It does get into our hydrologic system, uh, which is our water system. And if you start to think about it, you know, half of the country um, uses groundwater systems like wells. We're on a well. Yep. Hopefully the wind's not too bad for y'all. Um, so 50% of the country is actually on groundwater systems that the pesticides, um, insecticides and fungicides, and, and we'll say pesticides, which I think is probably gonna encompass all three, yep. um, but it's getting into those systems. And if y'all think it's not getting into the sewer system, y'all are kidding yourselves. Yeah, there's an episode of, uh... Uh, micro. The, uh, oh, uh, uh, Dirty Jobs. Dirty Jobs. Go back and look up um, his sewer, his sewer <laughs> jobs. <laughs> oh, and that's just the stuff you can get out with a shovel, you know, because, you know, most cities are de dependent on uh, recycling their, uh, all their water. 
Yes, so. and I we've got numbers here, so I'm going to refer back to them um, occasionally because there are a lot of numbers that we're going to throw at you. Um, but as we've talked about, once it's in the atmosphere, um, you know, it, it's going to go through that hydrologic system, which is basically our water systems. And I want you to think about something for a moment. The Environmental Working Group, now this is just in 2021, found 56 new contaminants in our water. Those contained pesticides, radioactive materials, and water disinfectant byproducts. Boy, that sounds yummy, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's all right, just to dump, dump some more chemicals like chlorine in it, and then it's safe to drink. Yes. Hmm. And the Center for Biological Diversity states that pesticides pose a grave threat to soil health and soil organisms. And as we've talked about multiple times, y'all, there is way more life below the soil than there is above the soil. Um, you know, and if you kill soil life, uh, you kill the soil, which is a main reason why we don't worm. Yep. So we, War yeah. We're talking about worming our, our sheep. We, we rotationally graze that way. They get worms from eating around their own poop. Mm -hmm. So if by, by moving them frequently, their food isn't why they're poop. They don't get worms. We don't have to use chemical dewormers, which chemical dewormers kill the worms in the soil and things don't grow or don't grow as well. So Yes, and it, it, it kills that, that soil life. And so uh, what, what happens if you have... Uh, like your livestock in a barn, what'll happen is like Ben said, those feces, they'll, they'll poop, they'll pee. And even as that gets picked up, those organisms are still in there. So they're eating off of that ground. So all of your livestock are sharing in all of those worms, coccidiosis, all of that. And you're going to need to give them dewormers and medications to stop that. So most of that goes away once you actually put them into a pasture and start rotationally grazing. They're not eating um, at their own poop. They're not eating, um, they're not all sharing the same food on the same floor that's got all those well, pests. And that's why we also free ranged our birds. And I'm coming to you because I wanna show you, I'm gonna turn you around real quick. And yeah, we, we are, free we, range when we're out here because yeah, of the predator issues. Yep, but you can see there, this is their fenced area, but it's open right now because we're out here. And they are just out enjoying the bugs and the seed heads and all that stuff. So, so yes, yes the same, same with our birds. They're not, you know, they're not stuck in here eating around their poop all the time. Yes. So, and there have been 400 studies that have been compiled and they found that they harmed beneficial soil dwelling invertebrates. These are earthworms, ants, beetles, um, ground nesting bees, and 71% of cases reviewed. So 71%, and, and as we talked about, um, these are talking about ground nesting bees, but you need to understand that chemicals are hurting our beneficial insects like our, our butterflies, like our bees, just as they are the bad insects. Yeah, and we're not talking about, you know, taking out and spraying, spraying the insecticide on the bees or the butterflies, no, but you're playing, spreading, spraying herbicides on the flowers that they're eating and they're taking that nectar, that po that toxic nectar back to the hives. And, or killing. Or, or just killing them outright. Killing the plants outright. And yes. we have areas on our homestead that we leave wild. And I'll put a picture in here for you. Um, just a couple of places we leave wild in that so the, the insects um, can have a natural ecosystem and the bees and the butterflies and all of the good pollinators um, can actually get it. Like we have a bunch of ragwort growing. I'm not a huge fan of ragwort, but the bees and bees the butterflies love it. love it. So we're leaving places that have ragwort. Well, and it's one of the few things that's blooming this time of year. Mm -hmm, so that's true. They, yes. they need it. They're they're ramping up to store up for winter, so they need those flowers. Yep, the goldenrod and the ragwort both. Yep. Yep. Now I want to throw a number at you, and this is going to be <laughs> really hard to fathom. So we kind of came up with some descriptions to help you, but we kill. Th is it three point? Yeah, three point five quadrillion yeah yeah quadrillion I, I had to look it up in my phone to get that many zeros yes 3.5 quadrillion insects a year in the united states and y'all i have i'll have links to um every place that we got these numbers for you so you can go back and do your own research and see that we're not lying to you um yeah. but yeah 3.5 quadrillion so do you want to try to explain to them well, and that was what I said. We have eight billion people worldwide, right? Mm -hmm. So we are we are killing the equivalent of it was like four hundred and thirty-seven thousand 
times mm -hmm. the human population every year in insects. In the U.S. If that makes sense. No, not in the U.S. No, no, oh, I'm saying, oh. yeah, the 3.5 quadrillion is just what we're killing in America. Oh, oh, that's not even worldwide. Okay. Yes, but that gives you an understanding. 437,500 times the insects we're killing just in America as people on the planet. Yep. And the other thing we try to think of, so <laughs> Pluto, right? Yep. We know Pluto's really far away. So How many miles away is Pluto? Uh, it's in my phone. <laughs> uh, 3.6 billion miles away. Okay. So it would if take you, 10, so if, yeah. If every insect represented one mile... Yes. And Pluto is, what was it? Ten, it would take 10 years to reach Pluto from would, here. Yeah, if you traveled, if you traveled, it would take 10 years just to get to Pluto. With our but, current technology. Right. But if every insect represented one mile, you could go to Pluto for... 486,000. 486,000 trips. Round one, trips, one, no, if we no. did our math right. Yeah, 486,000 yeah, round trips. trips to Pluto. Yes, that's, so that, that, yeah. Yeah, and it takes 10 years to get there. So you, you throw another zero on that, you get your four, it would take you 4 million hours or something. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. We're, it was we're, a lot. We're, 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 going, we're going off way deep, but we're trying, we're trying, to, trying to help you get your, your, your mind around the number. And, you know, when I say quadrillion, you know, I might as well say, you know, the national debt's 32. Yeah, right? Enough. It's like, I know, I can't even fathom. Like, remember, we were, like, younger. We couldn't even fathom a billion. No. And now we're saying a billion like it's no big deal. Yeah. Ah, no big deal. Billions have dropped in cryptocurrency. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so now... So that's just that's just to give you an idea, right? And, and here's the thing. When you are spraying, right? When you're spraying your lawns, when you're spraying your gardens, you're killing beneficial insects just as much as you're killing bad insects. And what happens, so when you have uh, a lot of good beneficial insects, they eat the bad insects, just like we talked about in the last video about yeah. the um, parasitic wasps that were eating the tomato hornworm, right? It looks awful, but they will get rid of the bad bugs. And when you go in and spray, you kill all of the insects. And then what you oftentimes have left, the insects that survive are the bad insects, and they just end up getting more resilient. Mm -hmm to the chemicals that we're spraying. So we need to spray even more and stronger chemicals and it creates this horrible cycle. Super bugs, yep. Super bugs, exactly. And we can actually see the evidence of this actually in honeybees. Um, and you can read about this. Um, there's a really great book, Restoration Agriculture by Mark Shepard. And he, he goes into detail about um, bees in this country. So I actually didn't know, but uh, honeybees are not native to North America. Nope. So I didn't realize this. I thought we would have had some form of honeybees, but apparently we did not. Nope. Before European settlers actually brought honeybees to America, a lot of plants were actually um, pollinated by insects, right. which I didn't know. Yeah. Most of ours are Italian bees or Russian. Yeah, so. that's true. Yeah, yours are, are ours. Ours are Russian. Italian. They're Italian. I think they're. I think. I'll I have know. to look. But sure. so so they so be, honeybees were brought to America for um, their wax and for their honey. Obviously, um, you know, Europeans love to mead. <laughs> Oh, yes. um, so they were brought over for, for honey, um, as I stated, and, and for the wax for candles. But it was very specific people that would, um, uh, would basically deal, deal farm the them. bees, would, yeah, yeah. would deal with them. Yeah. So do you want to explain kind of like the propolis and why it was so, so difficult to raise bees back then? Well, they... I'm not sure exactly how I can explain it. I, I don't know exactly how. They, I, I assume that they brought them over in just a box. They they had and, hives, yeah. They had hives, but they didn't. They weren't like today's hives, where you can take off the top, pull out the the different combs, and spin the honey off, and all that. They didn't understand what they called bee spacing, and it was what's his name? Langstroth. Uh, Langstrom. Langstroth. I thought it was a Langstroth hive. Yeah. Yes, in the 1800s. Well, he, he started to understand this bee spacing and left enough space between the, the comb where they were building their hive and a lid because anything, anything smaller than, I think it's quarter inch, it's a little more than a quarter yeah. inch, uh, a little more than a quarter inch, the bees would actually, they don't like space, so they'll fill it in. And what one of the things they would fill it is with propolis. Propolis? Propolis. Propolis. Still can't get that right, and I had I was the one in class. <laughs> right. 
bee glue. And this stuff is very difficult to get apart. That's why they actually have beekeeper tools to, sometimes you, they'll, they'll put it over a bead of it around the inside lid and glue it on there. So you have to kind of break that loose to get to your, to your comb. But until that time, there are very specific people that would handle the bees, and uh, I'm sure they got lots of stings. And oh yeah, because yeah, because trying to take the top off to actually do the honey, the bees yeah, would were, get really angry. You were and... Rattling them pretty good. Yeah. But now you know, now with that understanding, now average Joe can have beehives like us. Yes. So. And so what happened was, so Langstroth basically revolutionized the entire industry mm -hmm. um, in the 1800s. Um, so then everybody could start having bees. And so it became, you know, a commercial crop, yep. essentially. And so what happened was um, everything was going good. A few decades after the hive, after Langstroth's hive, um, all of a sudden there was a sudden, what they called a sudden death syndrome for bees. And all of a sudden we started seeing colony collapse. And I didn't, I had thought colony collapse was a new thing. Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, so they... Uh, so a few decades later, they had started using chemical, more and more chemicals on our crops and our agricultural systems. They developed a chemical that worked, um, saved the bees, and at that time it was a bacteria. They all patted themselves on the back and said, yeah, hey, you know, we beat it, we're good. Well, about three decades later, mm -hmm. we had another issue. Well, we got more chemicals from World War II, found a new chemical, created a new chemical, whatever it was, discovered it, um, sprayed mm -hmm. it on the bees, got rid of the issue again. Uh -huh. A few decades later, again. Here we are. Here we are again. Bees start dying off again. Um, we, we found either developed probably another chemical. I don't know if they found it developed. I believe it was developed. Um, another chemical in Vietnam. Hey, yay, figured it out again. Mm. Well, here we are again. Mm. And now we're dealing with the trache what, tracheal and varroa mites, yep. which are killing our bees. And here we are again dealing with colony collapse. So, I mean, that is just a really real world example of what happens when you continue to use chemicals, you end up getting these super bugs and that's all that, that, that chemicals really do. Super bugs or, you know, some of the other chemicals, like we said, they're, you know, they're, um, it's an herbicide and these bees are carrying some of that back to their hive and where it gets concentrated down and, you know, they haven't proven that this is part of the colony collapse issue, but you can, you, know, That's make, common you sense. can come to your own conclusion about <laughs> that part. Yes. So, yeah. So, it, so you know, it just kind of shows you what happens as you use chemicals. Yes, they are great in the short term. And I'm going to tell you um, how many hours we spent this summer pulling bean beetles off and, you know, the squash bugs. And, you know, and thankfully that the guineas helped, especially with the potato beetle. But I would have loved to have just gone out there and sprayed something and said they're done, right? Yeah. But we we're not going to do that. We made a vow that we were not going to use chemicals on our homestead and we will find other ways. And there are other ways to do it. But we did spray, but it was not chemicals. Oh, we sprayed garlic. Yeah. Sprayed garlic gar and then milk on our and, trees, and, as y'all saw. And cinnamon. Yes. And cin yeah. To, to try to drive off some of the pests. But it, it's nothing that would harm anything. No. No. Yeah. So, that, so that's something that we, that we said we were not going to do. And we don't want it in our food anyways. Yeah. You know, we don't do it to, we don't give our chickens chemicals. We don't give our um, sheep chemicals. And I'm going to tell you guys, there's, there's a, an herbal handbook. I'll put a link in the description um, that really helps you deal with issues. When we brought some of the chickens home that we had gotten from a friend of ours and the few that we picked up um, to, to replace our flock, some of them it looked like possibly coccidiosis. I wasn't sure exactly what it was. Garlic. Garlic three days, three or four days, they were good. I add a little silver to the water, done, yeah. right? So there are natural alternatives. Um, but I also wanna you know, talk a little bit about the number of chemicals used, right? So what we started with in the, in the 50s really to what we're dealing with now. So the number of chemicals, we just had a few in the 50s. It's now over 21,000. By the year 2000, there were over 21,000 chemicals in use. In the 60s, the list of chemicals produced by the University of Nebraska, get this, double-sided eight and a half by 24 sheet of paper. In 2005, their guide to weed management, 168 pages. Hey, thanks JP. This just in. The 2022 numbers from the University of Nebraska are in and the guide to weed management is now over 300 pages. Now back to Denise and Ben in the field.
That's insane. And then, so, and then when you look at the entire amount of um, acreage that insecticides were used on in yes. America. This will blow your mind. 316 million acres. Okay. So picturing that, you're going, okay, well, 316 million, you know, you're looking at an acre here times 300. I can't picture it. That is almost the size of the state of Alaska. And we're going to put a picture in here of Alaska overlaid over the uh, contiguous 48 states. Yeah. Yeah. That's how much, that's how many acres we're spraying every year. Yep. And um, I'm going to show you a table um, that's going to kind of go over some of this. Um, but I want to also give you another reference here. Um, so in this table, you're going to see in 1960, the U.S. applied 29.14 pounds of pesticides on corn and 2.74 pounds on soybeans. Compare that to 2008 at 203.73 pounds on corn and 111.96 pounds on soybeans. Now, we know a lot of vegans and vegetarians tout the mantra that meat is murder. Um, but we can clearly see that anybody who eats from this um, large agricultural food system is aiding the problem. So, and as we've talked about, we know that there's far more soil life beneath the soil than above it. So, uh, it's really, it's, <laughs> so I'm, trying, I'm trying to say those, this politically those, correct. Those who live in glass houses. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I'm trying to be politically correct and we're trying to educate. But just the sheer number of insects and soil invertebrates that we are killing every year just in this country is absolutely astounding. And that doesn't even include the plowing and what that does to the... Yeah, this is, yeah, this is just the chemicals, chemicals. y'all. Yeah. yeah, this is just the chemicals. And we, you know, we're doing it to ourselves too. I mean, we're, we're having all kinds of health issues. We know it's, it's it, we, there's been plenty of studies that it's showing up in our urine, showing up in, in breast milk. So we're, we're harming the not only are we harming the environment, um, we're also harming ourselves. And, you know, you hear this thing, well, you've got to feed the world. You have to do it to feed the world. But are we feeding the world right now? We're not really doing a very good job of it. So I, I think there are better ways to do it. Um, and again, there's a lot of different things you can do. There's a lot of books you can read. That book by Mark Shepard really lays out a, a really great plan um, for farmers. But yeah, we're, we're, we're not feeding the world, y'all. We're not doing a good job now as it is. So but we feel like there's there's better ways to do things. Right. I mean, just you know, rotational grazing, you know, one it keeps keeps the animals healthy, but it also fertilizes and you know, the grasses grow great. I mean, our pasture is, has improved tenfold since we've been here and it's been less than 2 years, well, what, a year and a half a year that we've since had, the, we had the animals. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's just a, it's just a, amazing what can happen when you work with nature instead of fighting it. Yes. And that's Leading back to what I said originally, you know, stop, drop, and weed. Don't, don't go get a bottle of, you know, I don't want to say any brand names, but and and spray your lawn or whatever. You know, if if you've got to do something drastic and you don't feel like going, you know, taking a screwdriver and, and pulling out a weed or two, you can get a weed torch. They're easy to use. Yeah. They burn. The plant that the, the weed dies and it just breaks down right there in the soil. We can all use a little bit of exercise. Get out there, get on your knees, say a prayer while you're there, <laughs> pull the weed, and move on. Well, and, and, and it saves you money. Well, and not just that, right? It's a way to fertilize your lawn or your garden. So all of those weeds you're pulling up have nutrients in them. So once you pull it, and if you set it down on your garden, your lawn, whatever, it'll break down and feed and, and go back to feeding your lawn or your garden or whatever it is. So there's huge benefits to actually physically weeding and dropping them on the space that you're weeding. Yep. So, yeah, but just, you know, we wanted to bring this to you to just kind of bring awareness and, and, and education. Um, you know, for us, we look at this, you know, God has gifted us with this planet and we want to do what we can to take care of it. And, and you know, we're not perfect. We make plenty of mistakes with that. I mean, you know, we'll go buy a bottle of water occasionally or, you know, it is what it is, but if there are things, if there if there's small changes you can make, um, you know, chemicals can be one of those those small changes that you can make. And even if you, you know, we understand organic food can be really expensive, and we know organic food still uses chemicals, y'all. Yeah. So certain chemicals are are approved organic, um, but we understand food can be really expensive. So if you can say, hey, I can't, 
I, I still have to support big ag. I have to go to the grocery store. We have to buy this food. That's fine. Maybe just say, hey, I'm not going to go buy Roundup or, you know, any of the other chemicals that are out there to spray my lawn to get rid of dandelions, which are amazing little plants that shouldn't be killed anyways. Yeah. But and I've got a great series, Beneficial Weed series. I'll put a link to it. Um, at the end of the video, um, a lot of what we think of, of as weeds are really not weeds, yeah. so they're beneficial. Yeah. You know, and and I uh, end our videos by saying, be good to yourself and be good to each other. Well, we're good to ourselves. We're not poisoning our land. But what if we went along the creek bed here spraying er, an herbicide, a really potent one? Well, that's not be good being good neighbors because that's going to leach into their well. And the water that gets into that stream is going to be our neighbors on down the way. I mean, yeah, that's a good, good point. You know, be yeah. a good human, be good to each other. Yeah. So <laughs> next time you go to the store and you're thinking I've got dandelions in my yard that I need to spray and get rid of, or there's weeds, Pull just up, make, make, take a moment. Make dandelion tea. It's good. You can make dandelion jelly. I want to try that sometime. Yes, we're going to try that. Yeah, I think my gardener made that once. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think he did. So, but yeah, just you know, just think about it. You know. I know this isn't an action-packed, exciting video, <laughs> but but it's important. It really is important because, you know, we've got everybody out there trying to save the world and buy an electric car and all these different okay. things. And, well, and y'all, electric cars are actually far worse for the planet I than regular she, I knew we cars. Could I know, you, you know, I couldn't resist. The green <laughs> energy isn't green, y'all. It's not. I've done a lot of research on this. Green energy isn't green. It has potential to be an, an assistant, an amendment to... Our power grid. But. There are things we we need to do and develop so that we can do better. But green energy is the solar panels and wind panels right now, y'all. Wind wind turbines are not it right now, y'all. Yeah. But that's a whole nother subject. I'm not going to go off on a rant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I lost. I was going to say something about it, but no, he was he was goading me. Not me. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Yeah, but let us know if you have any questions. Um, you know, have you thought about this? Did you know some of these numbers? I mean, I'm sorry, 3.5 quadrillion is, I mean, my mind was absolutely blown. Well, that's it. And yeah. then the state of Alaska, we're literally spraying the state of Alaska every year in our country. Yeah. So. Yeah, and then, yeah, when, you, when you see that overlay, you'll, you'll, you'll trip out realizing how much of America is getting sprayed. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, let us know in the comments um, if you've made any adjustments to try to do a little bit better, you know, and, and to try to reduce some of the chemicals from your life just for, for your health really is, is also a major reason why we did it. And for your pocketbook, that stuff's not getting any cheaper. Yeah, I can't, I won't buy bread, y'all. I, I make it because I just, I can't. <laughs> hot, dog I can't. Bun, hot dog buns. I'm like, let's pick up some hot dog buns. She's like, I can't put this in my body. <laughs> in our bodies. <laughs> yeah. Guess we're gonna have naked hot dogs. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on trying to make our own hot dog buns. I just can't yeah. get the, yeah. if, the shape if, quite right. If you've made it this far, let us know if you've ever made homemade hot dog buns and, and hamburger let, buns and hamburger and buns. And let us know how you did it because we've tried stretching them and yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying it, but it hasn't. It's not working yet. I'm still trying though. Yes. But if you have made it this far, make sure you give us the thumbs up. There is still a little bit of room left in the get together on the 22nd. Mm -hmm. Or Billy and Pinball and ourselves. Yep, email at uh, renewedhomestead at gmail.com. Yep, let us know who's coming. And um, and we do have Comfrey Root for sale. Yes, we do. At renewedhomestead.com. I think that about covers it. Chickens, anything else? <laughs> oh, so, well, I'll do, a, I'll do a different video on it, but walk along. We've got more baby Keats out there. Yes, we do. <laughs> So if anybody needs Keats and they're, and they're in the area in Western North Carolina outside of Asheville, let us know. We're, at, we're, about, we're outside of Asheville, but if you're in the area, let us know because we we've, got, we've got a few Keats we still have yet left. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. No. But, all right. Just looks, in time for the next rain to come. Yep, so. looks like rain's about to hit us. All right. As I said before, be good to yourselves, <laughs> be good to each other, and uh, get the pet spayed and neutered, go adopt a pet, right? Yes. Go adopt a pet. All right. All right. Take care, everybody. God bless. We'll see you on the next video. Thank y'all. Bye-bye.